welcome to a special Perusia podcast. I'm Shabal Raish, uh, and we are here in the studio at the Archdiocese of Sydney. And I'm with a very good friend. It's been six years since his last hour, but he's here on tour with the Archdiocese of Sydney in Sydney, and he's going to Melbourne as well. It's none other than Christopher West. Hello, Christopher. Shabelle. It's great to see you. So good to be with you again. Thank you for joining us. It's um, been too long. I know, six years was their last visit. Um, I remember it well. How many trips to Australia have you done now? Have you, have you kept count? This is my sixth time to sixth Australia. Sixth time. Wow. Wow. I actually remember the first time I met you was in 2003. That's 20 years ago 20 now. 20 years ago. I was ago. a seminarian uh, at the Good Shepherd Seminary. Uh-huh. And uh, you, you gave a two-day seminar, um, and it was beautiful. To, yeah, you came out and spoke to us seminarians uh, alone because, yeah, it was relevant. The message of theology body was relevant to everyone, celibates as well. And so, if you have a body, this theology applies to you. That's what <laughs> yeah. I like to say. It's beautiful. <laughs> but now, that wasn't your first 20 years ago. You were here even earlier than that. That was my second trip. I, I first came in 2000, and um, I was wow. working for the Archdiocese of Denver in Colorado in the yeah. USA, uh, back at the time, and Archbishop Shapu was the, the the bishop there. He got invited to speak by Archbishop Pell in Melbourne at a marriage and family conference, and Archbishop Shapu decided to bring me along. And uh, I wasn't very well known then in the year 2000. I was my speaking career was kind of getting underway, but um, Archbishop Shapu donated my services to Archbishop Pell for two weeks. And I did a tour of the the Archdiocese of Melbourne um, in the year 2000. And I met a lot of Australians then that I still know now, and they've brought me back all these other times. So it's it's been a great joy and blessing. I've always felt for all these years, for 23 years, a deep connection with what the Holy Spirit's doing in Australia. Yeah, wow. Praise God. It's known um, as actually 2000, the year of the Olympics. In our wait was World Youth Day, and the theme was uh, about the the land of the Holy, the South Land of the Holy Spirit. That was the theme, and you did come to World Youth I Day. I did as well. come to World Youth Day. Um, In fact, it was the first time that I had combined my presentations with the music of Mike Mangione at okay. World Youth Day here in Sydney. How about that? So coming back on this trip with Mike again uh, has been a, a great little gift and marker of <laughs> yeah. Every everywhere we travel in the world. Uh, people will come up to Mike and me and say, I saw you in Sydney in 2008, wow. and and it really impacted my life. So, yes, there's something really special about the Holy Spirit's movement here in Australia. Praise God. Yeah. Wow. Well, I want to unpack a bit about sure. you personally because you've been on this journey for a while, and it's fair to say, and I, and I don't say this lightly, but, yes, uh, we talk about theology body. We talk about St. John Paul the Great. But in the English-speaking world, most people I come across, at, at the very least in our circles, your name is definitely mentioned alongside there. And thanks to the hard work you've put into Theology Body to make it known, uh, I think it's fair to say if we didn't have a Christopher West in the modern world, uh, Theology Body message wouldn't have been as far-reaching, believe it or not, in the, in the modern day. So I think you've contributed in a massive way in getting this message out. So thank you for what you've done for thank, decades Thank you, Lord. Now. He... he what can one say? You know, he, he uses broken vessels to do his his work. And I mean, who else does he have, right? <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not like any of us get a, get to pat ourselves on the back and say, look at a good job I've done. You know, it's the Lord, the scripture comes to mind. You have not chosen me. I have chosen you. Yes. Right. And then you're like, well, why would you choose me? <laughs> I mean, when when I discovered John Paul's teaching, I was 24 years old. It was 30, almost 30 years ago. It's wow. 30 years this year that I discovered wow. the Pope's teaching. I was pursuing a music career. Um, okay. I, I was know. I was writing music. I had I had just recorded a, an album, and I was shopping it around to record companies. And I'm reading this theology of the body, and it's rocking my world. And I I, I traded in my guitar and my drumsticks, um, and went to study theology, uh, wow. and I knew I would spend the rest of my life studying his work and, and sharing it with others. I didn't know what form it would take or what shape it would take, but here, you know, here we are 30 years later, and I look back, and I, I still, I'm like, what has happened to my life? How did I, if someone would have told me when I was in my early 20s, uh, you're going to spend your life traveling the world 
uh, and you're going to become a, a doctor of theology and you're going to be a <laughs> I, 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 you're going to write theology books and you're going to be giving presentations around the world and and teaching courses and run a theological institute i would be like what excuse me i'm going to do what with my life <laughs> but you know i i didn't make this up i i just i'm just trying to say yes yeah i'm just trying to say yes to to a a calling and um Wow. The rest is in the Lord's hand. Well, it's all in the Lord's hands. I'm just trying to say yes. Amen. Well, can you tell us? Yeah, let's. Uh, I want to go on a bit of a journey about not only how you started. So now that we know the spark. Were you always? I mean, were you practicing your faith up until then? Where, where was? Where were you at spiritually? Yeah, I, uh, I was raised in the church in the 70s and 80s. I was born in the late 60s, and um, you know, it was a time of real cultural upheaval. Okay. The sexual revolution was in f- getting up in full swing, and um, it was post Second Vatican Council, and there were attempts to implement the teachings of the Council. But we all know the the quote spirit of the Council mm-hmm. idea that it was not really the spirit of the Council, but the spirit of a misinterpretation of the Council. And mm. a lot of uh, Catholic um, catechesis was very, very poor in the seventies and eighties. And I came up in the church in that time, and the basic message in the air when it when it came to this deep hunger that I felt in my bones, like from a very early age, I felt this almost agonizing hunger for something. And no one in my Catholic schooling, no one connected the dots for me between that hunger that was mm-hmm. was raw and made me feel vulnerable and um, made me feel anxious and all kinds of other things. Nobody connected the dots between that raw hunger I felt for something and what I was learning in religion class, uh, which I could, I could sum up with one word, boring. You know? yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to come home and climb my favorite tree and listen to my transistor radio and wait for my favorite <laughs> song to come on. And those were moments that decades later, as an adult, I would realize looking back at my life, God was wooing me. God was wooing me through my favorite tree and through my favorite song on the radio. I mean, I, even as I say it to you right now, Charbel, like I'm having this memory of being like 10 years old and there was this tree I had in my backyard. It was like 60 feet high and I'd climb up to this spot and I, I knew that tree. I could climb that tree with my eyes closed because I'd climbed it so many times. Yeah. I knew exactly where every branch was. And there is this post up in this tree where the branches were configured in such a way that I had two leg rests and two arm rests and I could kind of relax up there in my favorite tree. And there were days when the wind would come and I was so high up in the tree, the tree would be swaying. And I would sit up there for sometimes hours and I'd have my little transistor radio tuning into my favorite radio station waiting for my song, that my favorite song to come on. Did it come on the same time? No, 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 no. no. I would just sit there, wait, and hope for it, you know? And and when that song would come on, so there were times when the song, my favorite song, I'm listening to on the radio, and this breeze is blowing, I'm up in this tree, and there's just a peace, a joy, a life was good. Hmm. Um, but I didn't know what the heck that had to do with what I was learning in, in religion class. Hmm. It wasn't until the early 90s, and, and here I'm, I'm in my 20s now, that reading John Paul II for the first time started connecting these dots. That creation itself, the beauty of creation, is, is, a woo, is how God woos us. Our, our hearts are wired for the true, the good, and the beautiful. And that's what that hunger is that, that I felt from such a young age. It's a hunger for what is true, good, and beautiful. And I, had, I was so shocked reading Theology of the Body, 24 years old, and it was as if John Paul was speaking to me directly. Like, this is how I heard it. It was like the Pope was sitting down with me and saying, Christopher, you know that hunger you felt as a boy uh, that has only grown stronger and stronger and stronger as you've grown? Uh, yeah, yeah, I know that hunger. He says, well, it has a name. It's called Eros. E-R-O-S, right? The church borrows her language from the Greeks. This aching, pining, yearning for all that is true, good, and beautiful is what John Paul II says is this upward impulse of the human spirit towards the true, the good, and the beautiful. That's eros. And Christ does not want us to repress 
this 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 longing. You know, in English, we we would translate eros with the word erotic, right? Yeah. But in my mind at the time, again in my early twenties, that which was erotic was synonymous with that which was pornographic. Hmm. And and that's exactly the enemy's approach to take the true good and beautiful and <laughs> twist it. Yeah. You're right. I, I always say to my students, uh, and it's and it's one of the most important principles of the universe. The devil does not have his own clay. It's so important that we understand that. And by that, what, what do we conclude from that? All the devil can do is get his hands on God's clay and twist it, distort it. And the goal of the redemption is not to throw away this twisted clay. The goal of the redemption is to untwist that twisted clay to restore creation to the purity of its origins. So even in the things that I was attracted to as a teenager, for example, that really took me away from my faith, I was raised in, in what I w- I've come to call the starvation diet gospel. Right? And, and by that I mean the message in the air was your hungers are bad. Okay. They're only going to get you in trouble. You need to repress all that but follow all these rules and you'll be a good upstanding Christian citizen. That's what I call the starvation diet gospel. I became very attracted as a teenager to what I've come to call the fast food gospel, which is the secular culture's promise of immediate gratification for the hunger, right? And I don't know about you, Charbel, but I'm a hungry dude. (laughs) And if the only two choices are starvation or fast food, I'm I'm going for the chicken nuggets because I'm hungry. Uh, and, and I don't want anybody to lie to me. Those chicken nuggets taste good going down. When you're really hungry, they do. But if that becomes your steady diet, you're, you're going to end up not feeling so well after a while because mm-hmm. of all the grease and sodium, so to speak. And that's what put me on my knees in my college years. I was in a lot of pain. And, and I, I cried out in a college dorm in, in 1988. I'll never forget it. It was a pretty ragged prayer, but it was an honest prayer. And it was, God in heaven, if you exist, you better show me why you gave me all these desires because they're getting me and everybody I know into a hell of a lot of trouble. What am I supposed to do with this desire? And that's what led me to the discovery of the theology of the body. And and for the first time, I I discovered uh, Christianity is not a starvation diet. It's an invitation to a wedding feast, Mm. a feast of life-giving love that truly corresponds to the deepest cry of the heart. Um, so that's a long-winded answer to your question. Was I always involved in my faith? No. I left the church uh, for the fast food approach because that was much more attractive than the starvation approach in my teenage years. But I came back in my early 20s when I discovered this banquet. Wow. How, how, how did you come across the theology? Did someone give you a book? Yeah, I'll, I'll never yeah, forget it. Um, I know the exact date because <laughs> it was my sister's 20th birthday, which was September 26th, 1993. Um, She had befriended her high school theology teacher and her had become good friends. And so she invited her high school theology teacher to our parents' house for her birthday celebration. And I, at that point, had been scouring the scriptures for about three years to try to understand why did God make us male and female And what is God's plan for erotic desire? Because it had gotten me in a heck of a lot of trouble. And over the course of these three years, I'd say like from 90 to 93, um, I was just, Lord, please show me. Why am I a man? What are these desires for? And if the Bible's your word, which was what I was taught growing up, so, you know, Catholic schools, nonetheless, they they planted some good seeds in me, right? Uh, It wasn't all bad. and those seeds were now sprouting. Like, okay, the Bible, that's, I was taught that that's God's word. So if it is, there's got to be something in there about God's plan for, for man and woman. And over the course of those three years, I came to see what I would now call, with the help of John Paul II, this spousal vision of the scriptures. And by that I mean the Bible begins with the marriage, right? Begins with our creation as male and female and the call of the two to become one flesh. That's, that launches the story, right? Throughout the Old Testament, God speaks of his love for his people as the love of a husband for his bride. In the New Testament, 
the love of the eternal bridegroom takes flesh. And at the end of the story, uh, the book of Revelation describes heaven as a marriage, the marriage of Christ and the church. Well, when you have the, those two bookends, right, begins with the marriage, ends with the marriage, and right in the middle you have the Song of Songs, yes. this great erotic love poetry of the scriptures that saint after saint after saint has mined. You know, uh, the saints have written more commentaries on the erotic love poetry of the Song of Songs than any other book in the Bible. Wow, okay. Why? What did the saints know that we need to get in on? They understood the spousal vision. They understood that the whole Bible can be summarized in five words. God wants to marry us. And God wanted this eternal marital plan to be so obvious to us, he chiseled an image of it right in our bodies when he made us male and female and called the two to become one flesh. This is a great mystery, St. Paul tells us, and it refers to Christ and the church. So over those three years of, of studying the scriptures, I came to see at least elements of this, and I was sharing it with people. I was like, did you ever think about the Eucharist as the consummation of a marriage? Like, this is where the bridegroom and the bride come together, and this is where the bride conceives new life. Yes. And did you ever understand that, that sexual intercourse is, is, is meant to express the, the love of God? And that's why the church says it's for married people, because marriage is the commitment to love as God loves, and God doesn't love us in a one-night stand. God's love is forever. That's, that's why the church teaches this stuff. I was connecting all these dots, yeah. and I was sharing it so enthusiastically with people, but I was getting a lot of weird looks. <laughs> like, I, I remember one guy saying to me, why are you talking about sex so much? You should be talking more about Jesus. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. For me, when I talk about sex, I'm talking about God's plan for man and woman and the two coming together as an image of Christ's love for the church. I started to see how our bodies as men and women reveal the mystery of Christ. I mean, what is the mystery of Christ? It's the mystery of God taking on a body, right? In the fullness of time, God sent his son born of a woman, a male child born of a woman. Christ comes as the bridegroom to redeem the bride. It's, it's, you can't understand Christianity apart from our creation as male and female. That's what I was coming to see. I wasn't getting much affirmation, so I started to think, maybe I'm crazy. And then, sorry for these long-winded answers to your questions. That's right. <laughs> then at that birthday party, my sister's 20th birthday, September 26, 1993, her high school theology teacher was there. And I, th I thought, you know what? I know she's trained in theology. I'm going to share some of my ideas with her and see if she thinks I'm crazy. So I just started unpacking some of this, just like I'm doing here. And the first words out of her mouth were, oh, you must have read John Paul II's Theology of the Body. I said, excuse me? No, what's, what's that? She said, you haven't read it? Oh, wow. Well, you're, you're talking just like John Paul II. I said, you've got to be kidding me. What? The Pope talks about Christianity and, and our bodies like this? She said, oh yeah, you're going to love it. I said, where do I get it? She said, well, this is in the States. The Daughters of St. Paul are a big publishing house in the United yes. States. I don't know if they, do they yeah, have a present? Yeah, they're here in yeah. Australia. Yep. And uh, they published it in, in four little volumes. The Theology of the Body, just to back up a bit, is a, a collection of uh, 129 Wednesday audience addresses that John Paul II delivered between 1979 and 1984. And it was collected in these four little volumes at the time. So the Daughters of St. Paul published this, and I ordered it, and Charbel, I, over the next several weeks, I devoured it. And it was confirmation after confirmation of what I had been learning, and of course, took me to a whole new level wow. of understanding. I just want to understand, yeah. so, so then, who, who joined the dots Early, so you didn't even have John. I didn't know that. So, Saint John Paul II. You didn't read that first. You read that after. Yeah. No, that, I was just so uh, what I was sharing earlier about the two bookends of the Bible and stuff. Someone just pointed that out. No, that's what I was learning in my own prayer and study of the wow. scriptures. I was Look just piecing that. it together, and and <laughs> I, I had no idea that not only is this the teaching of John Paul II. This is the teaching of the fathers of the church. <laughs> This is the teaching of St. John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, uh, Catherine of Siena, Bernard of Clairvaux. I mean, the list goes yeah, on and on and on and on. This is what the saints have known uh, in one way or another for 2,000 years. 
uh, John Paul II is taking the church's understanding to a, a, a deeper level, I might say, or he's giving us a, let me put it this way, he's putting what the saints and mystics have understood for 2,000 years into a language that the modern world can understand and embrace. Uh, he, he's real, I would put it this way also, he's, he's making the mystical insights of the saints He's saying, this is not just for John of the Cross. This is not just for Teresa of Avila. This is the normal Christian life. Mm. Not that we should all expect, you know, um, that we're going to get the stigmata like some of the mystics or that we're going to have bodily levitations like Teresa of Avila. Uh, No, the, the catechism says those are the extraordinary signs of the mystical life. But the catechism goes on to say we're all called to the mystical life in an ordinary sense. And the ordinary mystical life means we are learning how to open that cry of the heart, that, 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 that hunger uh, that the church rightly calls eros. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we, are, we are to learn how to open that yearning for union, for love, for joy, for happiness, for, for, for fulfillment to what St. Paul calls the great mystery of Christ's spousal love for his bride, the church. Right? That's what it means to be a mystic. We, we have three choices with that cry of the heart, with eros. We're either going to become a stoic and just repress it all. That's bad, that's bad, I'm not going to think about that. Or we're going to become an addict and aim that erotic longing at the pleasures of this world. Which, why do I call that addiction? Because if it's a yearning for the infinite and you aim it at something finite, it can't possibly satisfy. So what do you think you're going to need? You're going to need more. Mm -hmm. So you go and you get more. Does it satisfy yet, Charbel? Not at all. No. So what do you think you need? Mm, More. More. So you go and you get more. Does it satisfy yet? (laughs) No. So what do you think you need? (laughs) That's addiction, right? Addiction happens when we aim our desire for infinite joy at finite pleasure. So you have the choice of the stoic, you have the choice of the addict, or you have the choice of the aspiring mystic to learn how to open that yearning for the infinite to the infinite. Guess what the catechism starts with in the prologue? The very first words in the catechism. Do you know what they are? Uh, man's desire for God, isn't it? Oh, that's yeah. chapter one, oh, yeah. and we'll get to that. Okay. In the prologue, do you know how the prologue begins? I know. We've got catechism in a year, and I know Father Mike Smith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the very first line in the catechism is a quote from Christ himself that says, Father, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God. Yeah. Beautiful. Know Right, that Mm. biblical word no. Do you know where we get that? I mean, you know what the roots of that are? Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived a son. That intimacy. That intimacy. Yeah. The very first line of the catechism is the call to that profound intimacy with God. That's what we're made for. Charbel, you and I and everybody listening to us on this podcast, we have this, if we're honest and if we're, we're, we're courageous enough to look at it, because we live in a world that wants us not to look at the depth of this yearning, right? The, the marketers of this world, they know how to awaken our hungers, mm-hmm. but it's always a bait and switch. The marketers know how to tap that yearning for happiness and joy but then they, 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 they awaken it, and then they say, what you really need is this product. Yeah. Put down your three easy payments of 1995, and satisfaction is guaranteed, right? And we're creatures of passion and yearning and longing and hunger for fulfillment. And we, we, the, we hear these clever marketing pitches, and the imagery on the TV screen is so compelling. And we're like, okay, I'm going to put my three easy payments down. <laughs> and Because and, they said satisfaction guaranteed. And then it doesn't satisfy. And then I look for something else, and that doesn't satisfy. And I look for something else, and that doesn't satisfy. And then we can get cynical. 
And then we can get that angry at the desire itself. And we can think, okay, I'm going to repress it. I just don't even want to feel this hunger anymore. We could put it this way, a, a culture that sells us a counterfeit version of fulfillment will also at the same time have to market to us all kinds of numbing agents to keep us from recognizing the pain we're in. That's interesting. Um, can you elaborate on that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you a story from my own life. 1988. I'm a freshman in college, or you would say uni here, right? That's right, university. Right. I'm a freshman <laughs> in university. And I, I, I had bought into the idea of get drunk and get laid, this will make you happy. Right? That was the fast food gospel. Yes. And I had bought into it. But in my, my first year of college, when I was seeing the fallout on s Saturday morning after all the parties the night before, when I'd see girls weeping that the guy they had sex with the night before didn't even remember her. Um, and you're not supposed to feel your emotions, right? So what do you do? You're in pain. You go and you get drunk. And I just started walk, watching the, the party scene. Mm. And I started asking questions like, why do we have to get drunk to have a good time? That's right. And I did a little experiment that changed my life. I committed to myself for one weekend, I'm going to stay sober just to watch what's going on with, without being under the influence, right? And Charbel, it was such an eye-opener to me. I started seeing the illusion that all of this drunken, drunkenness was, and what we call partying, mm -hmm. was a mask for deep, deep pain. And I, I think about it, pain is instructive. If you numb your, your feeling, in your hand, for example, you just shoot it up with Novocaine and you put it on a hot stove, well, you're not going to even notice the damage you're doing to yourself. That pain, oh my gosh, my hand's on a hot stove, take it off. That's very helpful. That's, That's very right. instructive, <laughs> right? Well, we have a lot of emotional and psychological and spiritual pain that we're in. And that pain is also instructive it will tell you to take your hand off the stove, so to speak. And I I'll often say to people, the, the truth of the church's teaching on sexuality, when it's properly understood, I mean, I'm not talking the repressive list of rules to follow. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a, a divine vision of learning what it means to love as God loves. The purpose of the rules, uh, if, put it this way, if, if you are trying to teach someone to dance, and all you teach them is the dance steps and you never turn the music on, think how dry and boring those dance steps, dance steps are going to be, right? That was kind of my Catholic education. People taught me the dance steps, but they never turned the music on, <laughs> right? God is singing to us a love song that corresponds to the deepest cry of our hearts. And when you hear that love song, when you feel it in your own bones and you're in touch with your deepest longings, that love song, that divine love song is the sweetest melody you've ever heard. And you want to dance and step with it. Uh, the dance steps, the dance rules, so to speak, make perfect sense when you hear the music, right? And when you hear the music and you're dancing to it, you feel in yourself when you step out of rhythm. You're like, yeah. ooh, that, that didn't go with the song, yeah. right? But if all you've heard are, these are the rules of dancing, but you never heard the music, you're like, what the flippin' A? What, I mean, yeah. excuse me, but wh wh why, why am I supposed to just put my foot here? Because I told you so. Don't put your foot there. Put your foot, why? Because I said so. Yeah. That, that's why people reject the church's teaching, because they haven't heard the music, right? The, the gift of John Paul II's theology of the body is that it sets the church's teaching to the right music. And then the teaching resonates, right? If we're just teaching Catholic doctrine um, and we're not teaching it with the right melody, so to speak, we're really going to turn people away. Um, truth and beauty go together. Truth yes. and beauty go together. If we teach the truth without the beauty, we will scorn the truth. 
But if we go to beauty without the truth, we will porn the beauty. Mm -hmm. Truth without beauty, we will scorn. Beauty without truth, we will porn. And by that I mean we'll, we'll get a very uh, perverse understanding of beauty that takes us in the fast food direction rather than in the, the banquet direction. Very interesting. I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I think I went off on a tangent. I don't That's even right. remember how I got there. What were we talking yeah. about? <laughs> Sorry. I mean, we, we followed the journey about your, your introduction to Theology Body. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and through your scripture and then how it radically transformed you. You met the, uh, another teacher that was uh, that introduced you to yes. Pope John Paul II's writings and, and how it is part of the, our purpose. I, I'd, I'd love to then just, I want to touch on how it impacts on your faith now. Yes. Because... That influences everything, your prayer life. Yes. The yes. way you see the church teachings, the way you read the catechism and understand the church fathers and saints. And you've already beautifully touched on all that because I know that um, we're in a time where we're yearning for this. Yes, yes. And we don't know how to communicate it. And, yes. and so you do have the faithful Catholics in, in, our, in our pews still not understanding yes. um, the fullness. Here. And they're on both sides of the fence, if you yes, like. Yes, Our two extremes, our, our left and our right, without putting people in boxes. Sure, sure. But, I know what you mean. But we have, and you've sort of touched on it right there, and, um, where if, if we focus too much on, I guess, the humanity of Christ, it leads us down one path without the divinity. If you if you focus too much on the divine part without the human side, it Either leads down Either way, a you're in part. heresy, right? Yeah. It's so the it, holding it's it together deal. that is so hard. It's like, you know, with that experience where you have two ends of a magnet facing yeah. the wrong way, and you're like trying to hold it together. Yes. The truth of our faith is right in that tension holding mm. that together. Truth and beauty, as I was just saying, yes, have to be yes. held together. And you could even say, you know, I understand the limitations of those categories, right and left, mm -hmm. but the right tends to lean towards the truth without the beauty. Yeah. And the left te tends to lean towards the beauty without the truth. Yeah. How do you hold them together? Mm -hmm. I remember an experience some years ago. I, I went into a Catholic church just to pray and a, a, a third grade teacher came in the class with, or came in the church with her class, the students. And I'll, I'll try not to exaggerate it too much, but it, it went something like this. She says, now children, Jesus Christ is truly present in the blessed sacrament, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And we need to show special reverence to Jesus. So when I count to three, we're all gonna get on one knee. Ready, one, two, three. <laughs> and I thought, oh, good God, there goes another generation of disaffected Catholics, right? Because they won't believe in the Eucharist right, in 20 years. Right. Yeah. Now, if, you, if you're just looking at her words, what believing Catholic would take issue with her words? Her words were spot on. That's right. But what was off was the melody. What was off was the music, so to speak, to which she was setting those mm. words. And what impacts the human heart more, the words or the music? It's the music that impacts the heart much more than the words. Those kids are not going to remember a word she said, but they'll remember the tone of her voice, <laughs> right? Again, I'll say it. The gift of John Paul's theology of the body is that it sets the words to the right music. And in that way, it corresponds to that call to integration of, of truth and beauty and goodness. Uh, and you asked, how has this impacted my faith? I can't understand my faith without it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is my faith. Christianity is the religion of the theology of the body. And by that, I don't mean it's the religion of the catechesis that John Paul wrote called theology of the body. Uh, there are, I mean, countless mm -hmm. saints who lived long before us who never encountered John Paul's teaching. That's yeah. not what I'm saying. I'm saying rather the principle, theology of the body as a principle, this is the principle of the incarnation. God has taken on flesh. This is our faith. Yes. Theology of the body, in that sense, is Christianity. You can't understand. If, if Christian theology is always theology of the body because Christianity begins with the incarnation. It begins with God taking on flesh. And the very fact that that phrase, theology of the body, strikes Christians themselves mm -hmm. as an oxymoron, right? Theology, that's spiritual. Yes. The body, that's physical. Why yeah. would you ever, what? Theology's over here and yeah. the body's over there. 
we are not thinking as Christians, mm -hmm. right? As John Paul II says, and I'll just quote him, if it seems strange to speak of the th body as a theology, it shouldn't if we believe in the incarnation. For through the fact that the word of God became flesh, the body entered theology through the main door. Wow. That's JP2. Wow. So theology of the body is, it's our faith. It's, it's entering into the mystery of the incarnation. Uh, and how did the incarnation happen? Through a woman's body, right? The man's body and the woman's body tell the story of what our faith is. The man's body is an icon of God's desire to enter his creation. And the woman's body is an icon of the creature's desire to open and receive God within. Right? So pregnant Mary, Mary pregnant with Christ, is, the, is, is an icon, if you will, of the fulfillment of what it means to be human. Because here we have God has entered his creation through the womb of the virgin. And Mary's womb has been opened up and she has received the divine life within. Uh, John Paul II says, woman is the model and the representative of what it means to be human. Why? Because to be human, Charbel, means to open that yearning for inf infinite love, infinite joy, to the gift of infinite love and infinite joy. Only God is infinite. So what we're desiring when we desire infinite joy is we're desiring God. Uh, we desire to be filled with all the fullness of God. And this is the story that a woman's body tells. We are meant to open to receive God's love, conceive God's love, and bear it forth to others. Hmm. That's the theology of a woman's body. And the theology of a man's body, well, let me, let me st stay on the woman for a moment because then the man will make more sense. Yes. If the incarnation is real, then woman's body has truly become heaven on earth. Because what is heaven? It's the dwelling place of God. What did woman's body become in the incarnation? There it is. The dwelling place of yeah. God. Woman's body, that one of the titles that the church gives Mary, it's one of my favorites, is gate of heaven. Hmm. <laughs> huh, think about that. Mary's body is the gate of heaven because her womb is heaven on earth, right? Yeah. This taps into the deepest nostalgia of the human heart because that's where we begin our lives. We're all conceived yeah. in the womb of a woman. And nostalgia, do you know what the word nostalgia means? If you pick it apart and look at its etymology, it means the longing for home. All right. Right? Our home is our mother's womb. That's where we all come from. And that's, in God's design, that's a little prefigurement of our destiny. Right? Our origin and our destiny are related. Right? The, the catechism says, uh, reflecting on these two questions, where do we come from and where are we going? The Catechism says these two questions are inseparable. And we cannot understand the meaning of our life, and we do not know how to live our lives, uh, and we will be completely disoriented in this world if we do not know where we come from and where we're going. Absolutely. We come from the union of our parents, right? This is not just some random biological fact. This is a profoundly deep theological fact. This is theology of the body, right? And, and the union of man and woman from which we all originate is a foreshadowing of our destiny. The Bible begins with the marriage of man and woman, but it ends with the marriage of God and humanity. We are destined for a union, a, 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 an ecstasy, a love, a wedding feast. This is how the Bible talks about eternity. Again, the theology of a woman's body, therefore, is to open to receive this love, conceive this love, 
bear it forth. Her body is, is, a, is a, a temple. Her body is the dwelling place of God. Her body is heaven on earth. Her body is the gate of heaven. Well, what's the theology of a man's body? We are designed by God to enter the gates of heaven, to make the ultimate sacrifice of flesh and blood. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? This is my body given up for you. What is the role of the high priest in the temple? To enter the holy of holies, to make the sacrifice of, of, of that, that brings life, right? The, the temple, the Jewish temple, did you know the Jewish temple and its whole construction, the mystery of the courts, the inner court, the holy of holies, all of that is actually modeled after the theology of a woman's body? Never thought of it that way. <laughs> this, is, this is why only a man can be a priest. Because the priest is the one who enters the temple to make the sacrifice. The woman is the temple, right? Her body is the temple. Her, her womb is the holy of holies, right? And we are, we are the ones designed by God to enter the holy of holies, to give the seed of life, right? The, the seed of life. Uh, the word gender is so maligned and confused in the world today. It's been yes. radically divorced from the human body. And the, herein lies the problem. When you look at the root of the word gender, the root of the word is gen. Right? It's a Greek mm -hmm. root. And you see that root in words like generous, mm -hmm. generate, progeny, genealogy, genetics, etc. That Greek root means to produce or give birth to. Right? The original meaning of the word gender before the modern world divorced it from the body Gender means the manner in which you generate new life, right? Men do that with sperm. Women do that with eggs. Uh, this is where the gender difference matters. And that difference, how do you know if you produce sperm or how do you know if you produce eggs? Another gen word, your genitals. Your genitals reveal the manner in which you generate new life. Mm -hmm. In other words, when we understand words properly, your genitals reveal your gender, right? This is not just biology, this is theology. And when we, when we tinker with biology, we are, we are tinkering with theology. Why? Because the union of man and woman, precisely afforded by the gender distinction, genital intercourse itself, St. Paul tells us, is a great mystery that refers to Christ and the church. And this, Charbel, is precisely why the enemy hates with all his diabolical fury. Mm -hmm. He hates the gender difference. He hates the call of man and woman to become one flesh mm -hmm. because it's theology. It reveals the great mystery. It reveals God's eternal plan to marry us. And the enemy does not want us to reach the marriage of the Lamb. He has one goal, to prevent us from understanding God's plan for heaven, yes. for the marriage of the Lamb. So what does he attack? He attacks the sign of heaven, which is the union of man and woman. All this talk about gender reassignment surgery, when what's really going on, look under the hood, look behind the black curtain to the darkness behind, because what's happening? You can kind of reconstruct the outer appearance Right to, to have a man in some way look like a woman or a woman in some way look like a man. But in the process, do you know what you're doing? The, the person designed by God to produce eggs will now no longer be able to produce eggs. The man designed by God to produce sperm has been castrated and will no longer be able to produce sperm. Mm -hmm. you can, you can, it is impossible to turn the kind of creature that generates with sperm into the kind of creature that generates with eggs. It is impossible to turn the kind of creature that generates with eggs into the kind of creature that generates with sperm. You can reconstruct things on the outside to get the appearance, but it's an illusion. And, and we don't even understand that it's an illusion because we've been separating sexuality from procreation with contraception for, for 
you know, mm-hmm. uh, in the modern world, it goes back to 1930 when the Anglican Church was the first church to accept contraception. Uh, that's the original gender confusion. That's the original attack on uh-huh. gender. Yeah. Remember what gender means, the manner in which you generate new life. When you render your genitals unable to generate, it is only a matter of time before the entire culture degenerates. And that's the culture we're in today. It's Me, moved a lot, hasn't it? Even in your time yes, teaching theology. Yes, absolutely. I had to, my first book came out in 2000. It was called Good News About Sex and Marriage. And it was uh, 115 questions and answers. Just a couple of years ago, I had to update that and add a brand new chapter on the gender identity issue because yeah. it wasn't even on the table 22 years ago, 23 years ago. Um, so it went from 115 to 150 of the most <laughs> asked questions. And, and those additional questions are all around uh, homosexuality and yeah. the, the gender confusion. And I want my listeners, our listeners here, please to hear my heart here. I am not saying any of this to wag fingers or shame anybody or scold anybody. We live in very, very confusing times. Uh, It's understandable that we are really confused about this stuff. I'm saying this not to scold or shame anybody. I got my own long list of confusions and issues I got to look at in my life. I'm saying it to turn the lights on. And I'm reminded here of what Christ says uh, in the Gospels. He says, bring your entire body into the light and make no sh- make sure that no part of your body remains in darkness, he says. Yeah. For if any part of your body remains in darkness, how dark will the darkness be? But if your body comes into the light and every part of your body is illuminated by the light, he says, then your body will shine like a burning lamp illuminating your humanity. That's Christ. Beautiful. This is our faith. Amen. Amen. But the problem is, Christ himself says, men prefer darkness to the light. Come into the light. The light is our friend. The light is our friend. The light will not condemn you. Christ came into the world as the light of the world, not to condemn us, but to save us from the darkness. Amen. And we are in dark, dark times today. Let the light come in. That's the gift of this theology of the body. Praise God. Thank you. We're actually out of time. I can't believe it. I wish we had four, five hours together. Charbel, I'm so sorry. I, I talked a lot. <laughs> but, I, didn't, um, I didn't let you get much in edgewise. I'm but sorry. But this is great because I think uh, people got a taste of your personal, uh, a touch of your personal journey, how you got introduced to theology of the body, but your legacy is there. Um, how can we get to know more about what you do? Because you're now, we, t- tell us a bit about uh, the website if you want to visit. Sure, sure. Uh, and, and and what sort of things are on offer, what people yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, of course. A theologyofthebody.com will take you right to the work of the okay. Theology of the Body Institute. Uh, I am the president of the Theology of the Body Institute. We have, uh, we offer courses, and we are partnering with the Archdiocese of Sydney. This is Excellent. one of big the... big announcement today. Yeah, <laughs> this, this is a big announcement. Fantastic. This is wh- why we came to Australia, to announce our partnership with the Archdiocese of Sydney Excellent. to bring our certification program here to Sydney. And the certification program consists of eight courses. They're offered in a five-day format, if you do them live, or in an online format. Um, And we are going to be offering our courses uh, both online on a time schedule that works for the people who live down under. uh, And in the years ahead, I'll be coming back in 2024 to offer a course live. Fantastic. Um, we're offering the Theology of the Body Level 1 course online, according to the time schedule here of people who live in Australia, in April, okay. uh, April of 2023. So um, I'm sure you could be able to provide links in the show Absolutely. notes and whatever we'll do for that. the Archdiocese of Sydney. So we're very, very excited to be spreading this. Um, we have various international partnerships, and Sydney is one of our prime international right. partnerships that we've been working on. We're very excited to be unfolding and, and launching this certification program in Australia. Over the, We're going to unfold it over the next few years and continue right. to build on it. So very excited about that. We also have, um, if you want to just poke around our YouTube channel, uh, just go to YouTube and type in Christopher West or Theology of the Body Institute. That'll take you to our channel. We have hundreds of videos on there Excellent. Um, that you can just start learning, start exploring. 
My wife and I do a podcast called the Ask Christopher West Show, and she hosts it. She fields the questions. I give my theological response, but my wife's the star of the show. She <laughs> she gives her more just domestic life response. You know, she's just talking as a wife and a mom and and brings that angle to it. And I know people are blessed to, oh, yeah. by my wife's contribution. Oh, we get great. letters from around the world that, you know, thank you, Wendy, for balancing <laughs> out your husband's great theology <laughs> with all this, you know, more, maybe a little more down-to-earth stuff. Not that theology is not down-to-earth. I mean, again, Christian theology yeah. is that God came down to earth, That's right. right? We we got we to gotta learn to speak th- incarnationally. So what else did I... Uh, I'm so trying to think if I have left anything there, out. So that's all on podcasting oh, yeah. platforms. Podcast, go on any yeah. podcast platform, great, you'll find great. it. Um, yeah, we we offer some other podcasts of, through YouTube. Yes. We have a discerning marriage podcast that uh, I don't run that one, but other people on our staff run. Okay, we have a podcast called The Way of Wonder, where Bill Dunahy, who's a beautiful yeah. theologian, friend of mine, you know Bill Dunahy. Yeah, absolutely. He and uh, a f- priest friend of ours, Father Patrick Schultz, talk about art. And, and how art is sacramental. You know, we, I, we always want to say to people, pay attention to the art that speaks to your heart because beauty is the window into eros, yeah. right? Eros is the desire for the true, good, and beautiful. Um, every modern pope has said we cannot evangelize without art. So we have a we have a, a a great outreach to artists at the Theology of the Body Institute and a real emphasis on art. Beautiful, that's fantastic. Well, we're excited um, over here at Prusia. This I was mentioning to you off air. Uh, January has just providentially become a huge theology Theology of the Body sort of theme for us at Perusia. Uh and and so you know we we've we've come out uh, launching big big news is that the Tobit Institute. Uh, the Tobit book. Theology curriculum. of the Body Evangelization Teams the is team. what Tobit stands for. T O B E T. Monica Ashour heads it up. She's great. She's Brilliant. done great work. I cannot say enough about this uh, curriculum that she's designed for young people. Young right? people, yeah, right? Kindergarten to year eight. Right. That's Don't do not wait. Do not. It's, we have this idea that there's some magical age to get some yeah. magical talk or something. <laughs> the church says education in what it means to be male and female has to begin at the moment of conception and continue uninterrupted through our whole yeah. journey. Wow. Wow. So this is a way to invite your children to the banquet through Catholicism for everybody. Yeah. It's a great Beautiful. title and Beautiful. it's great work. So that's um, that's now available at perusiamedia.com. We're very excited to be launching that. Your uh, your last trip we had filmed into a course uh, as just an introduction to Theology Body. Mm-hmm. That's on the Perusia Academy now. What's coming out very soon is a Katrina Zeno deep dive in the theology of the body. Great. So it's all happening. Um, and, and now with the announcement of the Archdiocese of Sydney partnership, we're super excited. 2023 is going to be a very important year, I think, for Australia and the church here, but of course around the world. So let's, uh, we're praying for you, Christopher. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I give doing. a shout out to Simon Carrington yeah, as well? Yeah, please do. Simon Carrington has been a student of mine, and, and I, I've really been impressed with what he's doing here in Australia to spread the yes, theology absolutely. of the body. So fireupministries.com. Uh, you can go locally right here. You have a great Theology of the Body speaker right in the, right. right here in Australia. So check out the work of Simon Carrington, too. Please do that. I highly endorse him. He's on our Speakers Bureau, and he's, he's, a, yeah, he's a great friend. Um, and, yeah, and, and look out for the great work he's doing. It's phenomenal. Um, so I want to thank... Thank you. I want to thank uh, just the Archdiocese of Sydney uh, yeah, bringing you the up. Archdiocese of Sydney has done, done a bang up job organizing yeah. this, and and we're so appreciative and grateful to be working with yeah. them. The evangelization team, to go make disciples, doing great work, and that's what it's about. Let's go make disciples. And so, thank you, Christopher. Please you're pray welcome, for us over here. You got it. Praying for you. Thank you, brother. And, Keep uh, doing what you're doing. Thank you. We're looking forward to seeing you next year. Thanks. <laughs> I look know. forward to coming back. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless. That's uh, Christopher. Worse. I hope you enjoyed today's show. We didn't get. I mean, my goodness, we just scratched the surface, but um, please join us in praying for the Theology of the Body Institute and for Christopher West himself. And get in, get in touch. Uh, go to the TAB Institute website. Um, and so there's so much there. Hope you enjoy it. Links will be in the description below. That's another week on the Prusia Podcast. I'm Shabal Raish. Thanks, everyone. God bless.